Tiana koutou, tiana koutou, tiana koutou katoa. Greetings and a very warm welcome to the Financial Services Council's Regenerations Conference. Whether you're tuning in from Tamaki Makoto, parts of Northland or the Waikato at Alert Level 3, uh, or might have a little bit more freedom at Level 2 elsewhere in the country, uh, thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Clarissa Hurst from the Financial Services Council, uh, and I'll be your host and facilitator for today's session as part of our Regenerations Reimagined series. Uh, just a wee bit of housekeeping before we kick off. Um, if I could kindly ask everybody uh, to mute your microphones, just so that we don't have any external sound coming through from dogs, cats, kids, flatmates, partners, that would be fantastic, just so we can hear all of our panellists loud and clear. Um, now, I'd like to say a huge thank you to all of our sponsors, um, and in particular to Bravura Solutions, who are sponsoring today's session. Uh, we, couldn't, we couldn't run this without you, so um, really appreciate your support. Today's session is the rise and power of the retail investor, and what a very topical subject it is. Financial Services Council research from earlier this year found that almost 40% of the Kiwi, Kiwis that we surveyed were currently using or planning to use uh, micro-investing platforms such as Hatch, Shearsies, um, and so on. Overseas, we've seen the power of the retail investor reflected in GameStop. Uh, we've seen a huge uptick in the number of retail investors here in New Zealand. Uh, we've had you know, Kiwi companies such as Rocket Lab listing on the NASDAQ. And of course, it was the recent Allbirds IPO. And uh, Kristen, I might ask, um, Kristen from Hatch is on our panel today, so I might ask her a bit about that um, shortly. Um, but yeah, so many of us have been flocking uh, to these um, platforms for fear of missing out. Um, and today our expert panelists are going to be discussing some of the risks and opportunities um, for retail investors, both here um, and overseas. We'll delve a bit into the psychology and behaviour of these investors um, and also look at how Kiwi investors are making their decisions and how we can support them in that decision making process. So on our panel today, we have Gillian Boys, Manager Investor Capability at the Financial Markets Authority, Hugh Stevens, CEO of SmartShares, Kristen Lundman, co-founder and general manager of Hatch, and Bill Cheney, co-founder and director of Manuka Capital and chair of WealthTech. So I'll hand over to each of our panelists for uh, a brief introduction. Um, Gillian, I might start with you, if you could uh, just introduce yourself and, and your role at the Financial Markets Authority and maybe just explain how you, how you see this retail investing phenomenon. Hey, um, so yeah, hi, Gillian here from the FMA. Um, I head our investor capability team and I, um, uh, my team did some research into the, the rise of the retail investor. I guess we started observing this a um, couple of years out and we saw this huge surge and uh, yeah, in, in terms of growing the confidence and the ability of people to invest, there's these platforms have just made um, more difference than um, I have in the entire time I've been here. So um, yeah, we, we, we thought it was really fantastic um, that, that there has been this growth, but we wanted to understand how are people doing this? Are they doing it in a way that we would um, like them to be doing it? So we um, undertook some research ourselves. So I'll talk a little bit more about that later on. Yeah, really keen to delve into some of those research findings. Um, Hugh, we'll turn to you now if you could uh, introduce yourself um, and yeah, explain how what your perspective is on retail investing. Oh, thanks, uh, Clarissa, and good afternoon, everyone. So from a SmartShares perspective, uh, we are a KiwiSaver provider, but we also provide services to retail investors through our workplace savings scheme, uh, through our UK pension transfer, uh, through our managed funds range as well, uh, which about 10% of our KiwiSaver members take advantage of. Uh, some people call that a sidecar, but I suppose it's uh, just some voluntary emergency funds off the side of their uh, KiwiSaver. Uh, and then, of course, our SmartShares brand uh, is most well known for our exchange traded funds, which is, a, um, I suppose, a big part of the retail uh, investor revolution really as the products behind the uh, the retail story in, in many cases. So uh, uh, we're very interested in the, in the topic both as a product manufacturer uh, providing the products for and uh, and also as a, as a distributor through our own uh, schemes like our KiwiSaver scheme. Thanks Hugh. Uh, Kristen, we'll turn to you for your perspective on the topic. 
Well, um, yeah, Kristen from Hatch. Hey, everyone, welcome. Obviously, I'm pro retail investor, <laughs> being one of the platforms we're chatting about. Um, so I'm here. Um, although that said, we we take our role really seriously with um, that sentence, the rise um, of the power, and actually the power that is in the retail investors' hands. Um, I can speak to the U.S. share markets and and the power um, that we see there. And as an offshoot here in New Zealand, um, what we're seeing our investors doing and how seriously Hatch is, is taking um, this kind of power. And, and then of course, uh, what we see going forward um, uh, for uh, retail investors, both what they're interest, interested in now and kind of trends um, and opportunities for Hatch uh, moving forward to kind of empower um, this entirely new generation of investors. Brilliant, thanks, Kristen. And Bill, we'll turn to you. What's your perspective on the topic? Thank you very much. Um, pleased to present to you all today. I come from the non-retail side, which is most probably one of the reasons that I'm speaking, to give a bit of a perspective on how the hedge fund industry and the professionals um, have viewed the whole rise. And I think there's some interesting perspectives. I also speak with the hat of the chair as WealthTech, um, which is a working stream under the FinTech New Zealand. And obviously, we like to promote what technology does to promote uh, just uh, democratizing um, investments. Um, I'm an economist of heart, and I've always had this, um, this big burden of um, uh, people not being uh, given access you know, to investments and in such a way that they feel comfortable, especially the, uh, the way that the younger generation hopped on board and educated themselves um, you know, great thanks to the software platforms that actually facilitated that. But I'll just be giving a, a few little glimpses of what has been happening and the turmoil that it's actually caused some of these hedge funds, some of them um, losing great amounts of money. Um, but at the same time, a lot of them have made a lot of money as well. And they've actually joined um, uh, the, the whole trend. And there's some interesting insights I'll be sharing as well as a report by the SEC that actually took this very seriously and that, you know, quite a thorough and in-depth uh, report on this. Thanks, Bill. Really looking forward to uh, hearing all of your insights. So we'll get stuck into the discussion. Um, now to those in the audience, uh, feel free to use the Q&A function um, to submit questions that you might have uh, for any of our panelists. Um, I can't promise that we'll get around to all the questions, but we'll try our best um, to answer as many as we can. All right, so we'll start uh, with, I guess, the theme of opportunities and risks of retail investing. And Kristen, I might start with you. Um, obviously, Hatch is one of the key players in the retail investing space in New Zealand. And, you know, just the other week, we saw thousands of Kiwis sign up to your wait list uh, to invest in all birds. Um, how are online platforms like yours reaching investors uh, not normally served by traditional methods? Um, well, there's I, I kind of view uh, the modern investing platforms with three pillars that um, haven't historically uh, been done very well for this for a new generation. And when I talk about a new generation of investors, I want to be really clear that it's actually not just young. Um, we have a massive array of, of ages on Hatch. So it's actually um, more characterized by uh, if, it, if it's confidence or digital um, savviness. Um, and so it's not necessarily all young people when I use the term new generation. Um, it is just a new form of people engaging in a way they haven't historically. But the three pillars that, that I think uh, these platforms have delivered on, including Hatch, number one is access. And so that that's critical. This is, if you look at the financial elite and, and some of the things they've uh, been privy to to build wealth in past generations. The first thing is obviously access and they have access to world-class investment opportunities that haven't historically been available um, to this, this generation, um, new generation of investors. And so um, that's the first pillar that needs to be delivered on is a really low cost, um, easy to access. Um, and, and obviously that's, that's through digital means of um, world-class investing opportunities. The second pillar is tools. And that very much is in the nascency. And that is things like education and research and data and all sorts of interesting um, um, decision making uh, um, 
tools um, that uh, re that uh, retail investors have access to. And historically, that's been advice. But again, that has not been accessible to the retail investors. So we've got to look at tools differently um, as a pillar of our business. And the third is community. And if you think about, well, yes, and Jillian will chat, um, of course, to this, this rise of the socialization of investing, which um, is fantastic. And that's very much this concept of communities. And we'll talk probably to Reddit as well in a little bit. Um, but that is, if you chat think about the financial elite they had their communities be it on the golf course or in their um you know the wellington club or whatever they had these communities where they could talk about um, had access um, to information, to CEOs, to everything. And so communities have also been democratized and delivered via these investment platforms. So these that that is why this thing has happened. We've got, um, you know, a, a perfect storm of events such as, um, you know, our, our um, jobs have changed and that we're no longer with one company for life, with a retirement plan. Um, I think KiwiSaver is fantastic. Um, you know, happy to um, dig into that a little bit. But I also think... Um, uh, property, of course, has become increasingly inaccessible for those and those past generations have where they've accumulated wealth is not um, really um, um, uh, available to this this um, kind of next generation. Um, therefore, we have to look to other means. Um, and so if the investing platforms, this perfect storm of, of ways to generate wealth are no longer um, uh, viable or, or an option, um, we have to kind of deliver on those pillars now and, and the great democratization. And I'm a strong believer that participation is power. So mostly seeing great things, um, but I'll kind of stop there. <laughs> Thanks, Kristen. Yeah, we'll delve into some of that um, a bit more shortly. But Bill, I'm quite keen to get your perspective as you're obviously coming at this from from a different perspective. Um, is this sort of um, is this the end of these more traditional platforms or uh, I mean, you touched on before that um, hedge funds are kind of learning from this and actually getting involved in it as well. Um, so what what can we learn from things like GameStop and and this democratization of, of investing? Um, I think the um, uh, to actually understand it, we need to understand you know some of the things that actually happened um, around GameStop. And uh, just to um, refresh everyone's memory, um, everyone kind of refers to it as um, the home day traders who challenged the professional investors, um, specifically the ones who were short selling um, certain stocks that some people were very um, sympathetic towards. Um, now, there's a slightly broader narrative. Um, if you go and read uh, the report that the SEC did around this, they took it quite seriously and they um, dispelled some of the myths around it. But generally, people thought that um, it's this rough and ready band of people who um, took on the, the professional traders and, and beat them. And um, as good as that story is, you know, we, we kind of miss the, uh, the larger picture. Um, a few things that people may not necessarily know is um, that the, uh, the whole trend of Wall Street bets started most probably about a decade ago. And they were actually quite a successful um, software company who had grown their subscription numbers um, by quite impressive numbers over a number of years. Um, it really became prominent um, because they managed to... Um, on board approximately 10 million um, new investors over a very short period, a period of time. And that was quite impressive and um, you know, definitely something that most of these new platforms have, have realized. They're never gonna um, uh, replace the professional investors, but the thing that really impressed me is that they, um, they managed to use social media and these platforms combined together to create a decentralized hedge fund with um, 10 million different traders. And that's quite impressive in and of itself. If you look at the IPO that Robin Hood went through, they showed approximately um, $80 billion worth um, of capital trading you know, through the platform. Now, that would put them as the sixth largest um, fund um, I think you've got Man Group was about 120 million or so. Renaissance Tech had run about 130 million. Um, so those are fairly significant. But if you add up all the institutional and professional investors, obviously um, it's going to take quite a while for the 
uh, the retail investors to challenge them. But they've had a, a significant impact on the market. Um, and some of the things that my other um, fellow speakers will perhaps touch on around the psychology and the behavior, those things are really, really interesting. And um, the ones that I just kind of picked up from the, the news reports was, um, for instance, how um, uh, there's this one gentleman called Gil. He invested $57,000. And at its peak, he managed to uh, turn that into $48 million. Um, as impressive as that sounds, within three days, he lost $19 million. Um, but many of the GameStop um, investors who started early are still up. Um, and the reason for that is they turned the $200 million company into $28 billion. Now, I just mention these things because uh, I think the quantum of what actually happens sometimes gets lost because we tend to focus on the headline and we don't actually see the detail um, beneath it. Um, the other bit of detail was um, there was eight winning hedge funds that actually participated um, and the narrative that the retail investors, you know, managed to uh, bankrupt a few hedge funds, um, you know, because those hedge funds were only short selling and they couldn't cover their, um, their short positions was actually not that true. If you read the SEC report, um, that was actually just investors willing to push the price higher for the stock. Um, that actually uh, tends, turns out to be the truth at the end of the day. And so, as I mentioned, there were eight winning hedge funds that actually made $16 billion worth of profit, despite the fact the one that <laughs> lost $5 billion. Um, another interesting um, observation was that many of the small investors treated their losses like a socially responsible donation. The average um, balance in some of these portfolios was only about $150 to $250. So they really didn't mind. Um, there was this heart-rendering uh, post that someone put on um, on why he's willing to lose everything. I think he was on the hook for about $10,000. He says he doesn't mind if he loses everything uh, because he penned a letter and he said, this is for you, Dad. And he was referring to the global financial crisis. And for him, it was a revenge play. It wasn't so much the money that he was going to make um, out of this whole process. Um, he saw his father um, losing the family business, which was a concrete company, um, and looking at how the Wall Street elite or the, the hedge funds all got bailed out in 2008, um, he just thought that it was a massive inequity. And so there's a, some of those investors, I'm not saying all of them, but some of them really went into it with some personal reasons and not necessarily a financial gain. So really interesting how these things, um, you know, how regulators deal with that. Um, you know, how do you protect um, these investors? There's a very heartrending story about uh, parents of a 20-year-old who committed suicide because he actually misread. He didn't actually understand um, the statement, you know, of the online platform. Um, and so there's a lot of education um, that I think that has happened since then. And I really want to compliment some of these platforms. I've listened to, um, you know, some of the presentations on Hatch and Shazies and a, and a few others and how they're making this user interface um, um, invite people in in an accessible way. I come from the deep bowels of JP Morgan and BNP Paribas, and even I was confused after two, um, two degrees and, and both graduates. Um, you know, so I, I really just want to commend um, what I've definitely observed, even with my children. Um, you, you've got a great story about um, you know, your kids as well, uh, adopting the, um, some of these services and what it's actually done for them. And I, I just obviously am a huge promoter as you know, the chair for Wealth Tech. We just want to see how technology helps um, you know, drive the right outcomes. I might turn to you um, if you wanted to share the anecdote um, that Bill mentioned um, and also just curious um, obviously Bill you talked about you know we see all the headlines and we often don't see sort of the detail um, so Hugh I'm quite keen to get your perspective on when you know what's sort of beyond that headline and when it's too good to be true too good to be true because we often see all these amazing stories of people making heaps of money on these platforms but um, yeah, could you talk a bit about that? 
Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks, Bill, the, uh, for dropping me in that that one. Uh, it's always good to have a, a lead into these things. But no, look, I think um, I, I think the the interesting thing is that we don't talk much about or we don't differentiate between regulated funds and unregulated funds very much in the New Zealand market. And uh, and we do have you know quite strong regulation around some parts of the market and completely non-existent regulation in other parts. And I'm not sure that we do enough for our retail investors to to make it clear which is which. So that that's an industry-wide challenge um, as opposed to just being up to the regulator. Uh, but you know some of the things that um, we need to think about and make sure that it's clear that retail investors are thinking about is that. You know, when we say true, well, I suppose true to label would be the most important thing. And I suppose if you're going into an unregulated fund as a retail investor, then that really means that you're going into a in, into an investment that the person issuing the investment doesn't have to be particularly clear as to what's inside this investment. So whether it's a fund or anything, any other form of investment, it may not be very well disclosed what you're buying to start off with. Secondly, uh, I suppose regulated funds and offers have uh, a prescribed risk in indicator. So that means that you know how much risk you're taking, particularly in volatility terms. So what's the chance of a, of a collapse in value, um, such as one that um, Bill was just talking about? Um, thirdly, uh, I suppose, how much are you paying? Now, in, a, in an unregulated um, offer to wholesale investors, there isn't a prescribed way of measuring fees or how much you have to pay. So, in fact, you, you're, you're on your own in terms of understanding how much the issuer will make out of this uh, and how much uh, you will make. So, um, so in the end, what is true, I suppose, in, in fees? Well, you know what's true in a regulated offer. Uh, then in the fourth thing, really, at the end of the day, what you're buying is some kind of investment performance. But in an unregulated offer, uh, there's not a prescribed way of measuring that performance. So really, as long as the, the issue has not been misleading, they can really calculate that performance any way they want. And so uh, when you're comparing that investment with others, uh, you may not be comparing apples with apples. And I think this is where it comes, um, where some of these uh, um, dinner party stories come from that, uh, and I hear these all the time, you know, people say, well, I made X out of this investment. And, um, you know, it's, it's clearly uh, a number, uh, and it's been published, um, but it's not necessarily comparable with other products in the market. And so you can't say you've done better or worse. So I think we could do better in terms of differentiating between the offers that are regulated and ones that aren't. I'd, I'd mentioned that um, I suppose when people talk about, uh, I suppose, taking undue risk on single stock investments, um, there'd be, I, I would agree that um, you know, many of these investments are very um, small. And I think the story Bill was talking about was my son lost a dollar forty-eight on Tesla one day and he was absolutely gutted. So uh, but that um, you know, that that's a reasonable risk. Um, and I think it's part of that um, education piece, which is absolutely critical for people to learn about investment markets, much better to learn by doing. And back to Kristen's point, I suppose people didn't have access. Uh, uh, I suppose, previously to micro-investing. And so it wasn't possible to learn um, by doing. You had to throw the whole house at, um, at your uh, retirement savings to get decent, um, I suppose, fee levels and advice. And so you couldn't um, take risks like uh, you can today with small amounts. Um, but I do think... Um, uh, you know, regulation doesn't doesn't remove the market risk, and so you know those micro investments are um, um, are still um, an important way to learn about that market risk. Uh, and and you know, I would say that out of um, our involvement in the platforms, the sharesies, the hatch, the or various others, I suppose our experience across platforms is that investors have actually been reasonably sensible. They are putting in uh, most of their investments into very widely diversified ETFs, such as our SmartShares ETFs, and then having a bit of a play on top with um, single stock investments um, and, you know, $1.50 into uh, $150 into GameStop maybe isn't a, a bad thing to do. So for me, too good to be true is probably going to be an unregulated offer uh, and, um, and you don't even know what's true, let alone whether it's too good in, in that case. 
Thanks, Hugh. I think you raised a really interesting point there in that we tend to think of a lot of these retail investors as being quite risky or investing large amounts of money or being, you know, day traders. But um, actually, and Julian, I might uh, turn to you here. You, the FMA did some really interesting research into investor behaviour and, um, yeah, had some very, for me, quite unexpected findings. Um, so I'm just wondering if you'd like to talk a bit about what you found in your research. And I think you've got a slide to talk to here as well. Yeah, so, um, yeah, look, uh, I guess um, the research that we did, we talked to the platform users um, in New Zealand. So these are registered um, platforms in New Zealand, um, you know, with largely regulated products on them. Um, and obviously they are, they are abiding by um, all the um, the laws within New Zealand fair dealing, ML, all those sorts of things. So, so look, um, we we approached those platforms, and uh, we were interested to find out whether their users were using some of the other sort of um, non New Zealand based platforms. So that was that was interesting um, because some of them were, and certainly we saw a little bit of a sense of not really ever asking that question about are they regulated. Or, or rather any protections in place, that's just not something that enters people's minds very much at all. Um, but look, we did this research partly because we were hearing all the GameStop stories, we were we're regulators, we, we tend to be risk averse, we, we were worried that people were taking unnecessary risks on the platforms. And I guess there was a lot of talk about day trading, a lot of talk um, uh, about you know the investor as activist and perhaps disrupting the market in ways that meant the market wasn't working efficiently, etc. So we, we wanted to understand what was the truth of that. And um, what we found actually gave us quite a lot of reassurance. So um, what we saw was that eight out of 10 New Zealanders have got a much more favourable view of investing after using the platforms. Um, they're entering them for the reasons that, that Kristen talked about, actually. Um, you know, affordability was the, the term they used. Um, I know Kristen talked about accessibility, but same thing. The market conditions, so the fact that housing's largely unaffordable um, for, for many of the users or, or perceived to be. Um, low interest rates, they were seeing, you know, was there an opportunity to make some more money? Um, by investing, and and that sort of social factor as well. So their um, their friends, their family are doing it. Um, they're seeing forums, their Instagram feeds, their TikTok feeds are full of these things, um, and they are suddenly able to um, create their own communities and actually learn. Um, so in terms of the behaviours, you know, 80% of investors um, that, that we talked to were, were buying and holding. Um, they were displaying really, you know, what we would typically say were good um, behaviours. So they were researching, they were dollar cost averaging, they were, um, they were diversifying well. Um, and, you know, less than 2% said they were day trading now and in fact the New Zealand platforms are typically set up so you can't day trade very easily at all um, so um, you know that, that partly reflects that but we've talked with international regulators and in fact what they are seeing is exactly the same overseas so um, we were on a conference for World Investor Week and uh, the States, Canada um, uh, and various of the Asian participants have all run similar research to this and they're all seeing the same result that people are going into this um, and using them responsibly mostly. Um, so the two areas of risk that did stand out for us were around uh, a bit of FOMO, so um, you know nearly a third of investors did admit that they'd jumped into something without really doing um, proper research and, and mostly because they didn't want to miss out. Um, and downturn, so you know People talked about losses and they said, hey, yeah, I forgot my head around it. But when we did some of the qualitative, they found, they, they sort of said, oh, look, actually, um, we, we are a bit nervous about it. Uh, they'd only seen short term dips um, in the period that uh, we were talking to them. Um, and, and I guess we concluded that they weren't really psychologically or practically prepared for a, for a very big market downturn. So, so that sort of, the FOMO and the downturns are the two areas that we think, um, you know, we and, and the industry perhaps could focus in on in terms of helping these new investors. Mm -hmm. um, Kristen, I know that you've also surveyed um, Hatch investors, and I'm just wondering if, if your findings support those um, of 
the FMAs or if you had any any interesting different findings in there? Yeah, I was um, pleasantly pleasantly surprised with the FMA um, findings. I think because we we equally were um, while we can see hatch data, we were equally concerned about some of the noise coming out of the states and were our investors um, acting, you know, on a whole in New Zealand the sa uh, same way. Um, and so, yeah, we were um, generally pleased uh, with the research um, and some of the shortcomings of, of FOMO and and some of the concern areas there. Um, I think, you know, we, we um, so just very quickly, what we're seeing on Hatch is um, uh, very much kind of lump sums holding for long term. And I think there's just one slide we flip to um, when the markets dip. And keep in mind that, um, I think we can just flip through a couple. Keep in mind that, um, yeah, here we are. Um, this this question we asked of our investors and data supports it in terms of our inflows and, and outflows um, activity on Hatch. But this was actually asked after the COVID market crash. And so that was the first significant drop. Um, we'd had a couple corrections, small corrections before that. But that was the first significant drop um, that Hatch investors experienced up to 35% in a given day, um, which would have been. And so when we asked our investors, you know, what they um, expected to do should their share values drop substantially, we were pleased um, with the answers that they had. And that showed true um, with the data as well. So I don't think I've got a, a whole lot of other slides um, that would be helpful to this convo. But um, I do, you know, we were... Um, pleased in terms of generally speaking how investors um, are acting with uh, respect to the capital markets i know there's been a question about concern around um, speculation and around you know are we going to see a repeat of the 87 crash and, and um, people losing a lot of money and i think um, the comparison between then and now um, and the COVID crash in now is that the economy is very different. Um, New Zealand is now, you know, globalized nation, um, and we've got some um, very impressive companies listed on the NZX. And back then, I think there were upwards of kind of 200 IPOs during that very short period of time. A lot of it was a um, little bit of air. There was huge speculation in there, um, and very much could have been described um, as as a wild west. We had um, very little price discovery happen um, happening. Um, and there weren't great vehicles that retail investors could understand and participate in safely. And whereas now I think what we're seeing is um, the average, um, well, actually, I don't know what the average is, but on Hatch, we've got the majority of, of the companies on Hatch um, far exceed um, uh, market caps, you know, of 100 million and, and um, upwards of, you know, well over a billion dollars. And so very different environment, both in terms of our economy here in New Zealand um, and also also in terms of the investments, um, those kind of um, access to information, um, uh, instruments that investors understand and can participate in safely. I think we're a very different environment than back then. And so, um, you know, these are people participating in, um, you know, Hugh mentioned Tesla, um, with, you know, pioneers of tomorrow, massive market valuations. Yes, we can go on about some of these businesses, but for the most part, these are world-class brands, um, the likes of, you know, Apple and, and Microsoft that we are using every day, um, Air New Zealand, so on and so forth. So I think these are vehicles that we understand. Um, exchange traded funds, funds have come a long way um, in that we can spread our money across um, you know, hundreds of world-class businesses um, and diversify um, very well. So very different environment. Um, but what we did see um, during that crash is that indeed um, most people held as they indicated they would and not only that but they viewed um, those crashes as a time to buy good quality on shares and this was their words good quality shares on sale and they very much viewed it as actually a time to take advantage of those dips and buy more and so we have seen that behavior that said um it is very much we take our responsibility seriously. We know that the markets are, if we know anything, they're going to crash again. We're going to see some um, significant corrections. And so it's upon us to, again, um, deliver on those pillars. We've kind of access isn't good enough. We've got to continue to improve the tools and the community so that we're providing um, those. So we're providing kind of that great framework of behavior. And when it happens, um, we're coaching people through um, what they can do with, with all of the tools at our disposal. Maybe um, I suppose an additional comment to that is that if, if we look back over the, the market crashes, that uh, 
the ones that the retail investors understand, I suppose, are ones where market risk is is the predominant factor. And uh, and so, you know, March, February, March 2020, uh, we saw within our book, you know, a very low percentage of um, of members and investors doing something um, that resulted in, a, in a, a bad outcome, I suppose. So, in, in other words, we saw very few people switching just at the bottom of the market. Um, you know, there were a, there was a small percentage of people who did that, and we, we've been focused on trying to find ways of encouraging those people to um, take a longer-term view of their, of their um, savings. But, you know, predominantly people did the right thing in that situation, which was hang on for the ride, whatever risk... Um, um, level they'd chosen for their for their portfolio, so that's good. The thing that people don't seem to have um, coped well with, and that has impacted on the reputation of the industry, are are um, crashes that uh, I suppose have unexpected risks, and and I suppose it's compliance risk, operating risk, um, those you know custody risk, those kind of things where. Uh, it's not. It's it's about the plumbing of the industry in some regards, and it's about the conduct of the participants. And those things aren't acceptable, uh, um, and haven't been in the past, and and have you know killed trust. So I see you know there is a comment um, around here on on the chat about the eighty seven share market crash. You know, and as Kristen said, it was somewhat of a wild west, and we've learned a lot. Uh, and um, put in place some pretty strong regulations, not just in New Zealand, but around the world. But, you know, a key thing for New Zealand is that we can't stop here. And um, I've got a little uh, um, show and tell. Um, this is the uh, New Zealand regulations about, um, I suppose this is the, the FMA guidance, um, and I'm sorry, I'm going on to blur, uh, for um, custodians of platforms in New Zealand. Um, this is the UK uh, equivalent, which is the client asset rules from the FSC. So, um, you know, we, we I'm not asking for more paper, but um, that's quite, pretty stark. Uh, and I think one one outlier, one, one area where New Zealand is a massive outlier is our uh, regulation and understanding of custody risk and regulation of the same. So I think we've got a little bit of work to be done there. Uh, it hasn't been a problem in the past, and so it hasn't been front of mind uh, um, in policy making around financial services, but you know it, it is uh, an area where New Zealand is very, very different to the rest of the developed world. Bill, so just wondering if you have um, any further comments to make on that discussion in terms of um, yeah, if there's going to be a market downturn, what what are your thoughts? Um, sorry, uh, Rissa, you uh, directed that to me. <laughs> um, I don't want to be too much of a of a prognosticator. Um, I certainly learned the lesson, you know, not to try and predict the markets. Um, Warren Buffett has a famous saying that the markets can remain irrational for longer than you can remain solvent. Um, and you know, there certainly are things, um, you know, that um, that are a bit concerning. Um, I must probably refer to the, the everything bubble. And I think if there's one risk um, that I think has come out um, you know, from this panel, um, it's about uh, people not being informed about you know, typical market trends and what happens from time to time. And all markets have to go through the cycles. They can't just continually go up. And unfortunately, since the global financial crisis 2008, uh, the, the thing that staggers us um, as professional investors is how everything has gone up. And partly that's because of the low interest rate regime. Um, unfortunately, that has created you know, potential risks going forward, both because of the, the way that people um, form expectations about the market, same as you know, that could just as well be applicable to property values in New Zealand. You know, if people just think that properties can only increase you know, by 20% per year, um, they are bound to be disappointed at some stage. Um, so yes, I would say that there's um, been some indicators that we as professionals look at. Volatility has been just off the charts. Uh, I can almost just write an historical book just on market trends and you know how <laughs> these have changed over the past you know four or five years um, so yes there's definitely some some risk that people need to educate themselves of um, I think as you as mentioned and Kristen as well uh, and you as well Gillian uh, what has really impressed us even in the GameStop as we 
delved into the detail, we were surprised to see how some of the retail investors were more responsible than some of the professionals. Um, so one little factoid was that uh, retail investors were using put options uh, to protect their profits. <laughs> you, uh, and that's not the, the type of behavior that you know, one would have expected reading the, um, the headlines. Um, they were incredibly sophisticated that you know, I, some of my ex-colleagues in the, in the, in the big financial institutions you know, were not definitely following at that stage. Um, so yeah, I, I can just you know say that we we're living in unprecedented times. Um, some people have called it a bit of an experiment what central banks have done globally, and there's definitely something to be said about the everything bubble getting its um, um, its oxygen you know from the uh, the central bank actions, um, and I think we're going to see some very interesting times in the next five years. I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Bill. Um, Gillian, I think this is a nice segue into, I guess, the types of um, information sources that, you know, retail investors are turning to. Um, so I know you did some research into this in terms of where investors are going and what they're looking at. Um, do you want to just talk a little bit about that? What, what information sources are investors in New Zealand using to assist their decision making? Yeah, so... Um, we actually um, calculated that people were using about 4.7 sources of information. So we did kind of think that perhaps they were just going off what um, what Bill had said and, and uh, investing on that basis. But in fact, actually, people are trying really hard. But they're not necessarily using the mandated disclosures, um, for instance. So um, we actually had some people in our research who had been on the more traditional um, uh, platforms and they were more likely to say they used product disclosure information and annual reports and, and that kind of thing, whereas uh, the, the fractionalised platform users were, were more likely to say they used a social source or friends and family. Um, but look, we were encouraged that they uh, just, you know, they're looking around and they're looking at different information sources. Um, and we've put quite a lot of um, resource into developing content around how to access those more t traditional sources because um, it is important still that they um, do go to those. Uh, and I know that equally the platforms um, do a really great job of um, explaining how to, you know, the, the top three things to read in an annual um, report and, and that kind of thing. So, um, it, yeah, I, I think that as they get used to it, I mean, bear in mind these people are approaching investing for the very first time because most of them are in KiwiSaver, but they don't think that that's an investment. Um, so this is a whole new world that they haven't accessed before. It's full of jargon. Um, it's, you know, it it's quite different to anything that they've done before. So there's a lot to get their head around. So to sort of think that they would actually sit down and read a PDS cover, cover is probably um, in the land of dreaming. Um, so I, I think that as they get used to um, buying things and, and this is what they told us that they are learning by doing, um, then they will you know, use those more traditional sources more as well. Um, and so how can we better support investors to make good decisions. Obviously, you know, these retail investors are not as crazy and doing all this day trading as, as I guess is the perception. Um, but as you say, Julian, you know, they are new to investing. Um, and so I think it is obviously important that they are supported um, in making those good decisions. So Hugh, I might turn to you. Um, what are your thoughts in regards to how we support retail investors to make better decisions? Yeah, well, I, I was, I, I really liked um, Kristen's um, three pillars earlier, actually, the access, mm -hmm. the tools and the community. And I think that the thing that, you know, particularly interests me is is this idea of community that um, I suppose much of our uh, law and regulation in the space is kind of built off the paradigm of individual uh, decision making and um, even when we go and get financial advice, it's a it's an individual often, or um, uh, that is that is uh, you know identified as the client receiving the the, the advice, and uh, and I, I just think that's miles from how the real world operates. That actually we tend to make these decisions 
um, collectively or with someone's hand on our shoulder. And, you know, there's an opportunity for us to think into the future and uh, and to think about how, how do we include that kind of idea of collective decision making into the, you know, right to the foundation of, of the way financial services works and disclosure works in New Zealand. Um, you know, I know that the, the work that we're doing with the Taranaki Iwi and our Karu Ora scheme, we've had to think about this deeply. And I know uh, Fairawa as well uh, in the South has, has been doing something similar to, to say, well, you know, how, how do you build a scheme around the idea that actually there aren't individuals, there are um, groups um, of Fano who want to look after each other and help each other. Um, and and that's you know been brought um, into you know I suppose the um, fr- sort of front of mind for us through that scheme. But actually, all of our members act that way. And uh, and so yeah, we really want to think about um, not just financial advice. I think that's that's very much the um, the tip of the iceberg. The, the what most people want is just very basic pragmatic support. You know, reading documents, even understanding what the documents mean together rather than trying to do that individually, um, sharing stories of successes. But, you know, um, I suppose, um, you know, that's a part of it. But, um, but you know, really, ha- how do we provide that support? And I think that it's very hard in the current um, uh, regime, I suppose. You're either providing no advice uh, or you're providing financial advice. And there doesn't seem to be much room in the middle for just being practical and sensible and helping people make good solid decisions. So um, that, that's where I think we should focus is trying to carve out that middle ground, which is not financial advice. Um, it's just mm-hmm. um, basic support. I'll just um, add to that if I could quickly. I just have a couple a couple quick points. First, I do want to stress that um, retail investors are making good decisions. They're taking control of um, the money in their lives and they're learning how to put it to work. And so I think um, those that are not making um, good decisions are those, um, you know, that that have no concept of, um, you know, saving for the rainy day or potentially not participating and participation is power. So I think on the whole, what we are seeing is that hatch investors are um, significantly changing their futures and making good decisions by participating in the capital markets, um, brushing up on their knowledge, um, learning their risk tolerances, and even with the likes of AMC and GameStop, that is a very small and alternative. Um, which we don't offer, but um, I think that is a very small percentage of a wider group of people that are actually learning to put their money to work, which is a good decision. I think getting engaged with our money um, and um, really taking control is, is fantastic. Uh, in terms of, I agree with Hugh, actually, I think there's there's got to be somewhere in between of that advice thing. Um, generally speaking, retail investors and the rise of this retail investor, there's a huge amount of distrust when it comes to um the industry, um, be it um, regulators right through to um, traditional uh, financial institutions. And um, there is just a questioning of are their best interests um, in play? And so I'm not, um, you know, no opinions there, but there is a distrust. And so I think um, what we have to do is we need to meet uh, these investors on their terms. That's actually how we engage them and, and help them along their investing journey and to grow wealth is it is on their terms. And it um, if it's not a PDS or if it's not advice, it's whatever it is, um, we've got to meet them on their terms. And so if that's, you know, um, some form of in-between advice or um, however, if it's videos or um, social engagement or communities, we do have to meet them on their terms. And included in that, um, I would just end on a um, final note is that I think companies need to become engaged if we think about the shareholder makeup of um, a, a gen- typical company now, it will comprise far more, um, a far larger percentage of retail investors um, than it historically had. And uh, we'll use a meme stock, AMC. I can probably guarantee their shareholder makeup is, you know, massively swayed to retail investors. So putting that aside, I think companies need to step up and actually recognize um, that the shareholder base has shifted. Um, they have a responsibility to play in engaging with the shareholders and communicating with them on their terms. So that is, um, you know, they have to be transparent and cr- produce facts and documents, um, but recognize it's their responsibility to do so in an, enga- in an unengaging 
interesting way. Um, and we're seeing companies that are really starting to step up and do that um, in terms of making themselves available for interviews, um, engaging in platforms. Even Spotify is a great example in the US. They opted to go for a direct listing on the share market so that they could democratize that concept of IPO and going public, recognizing that um, largely will be retail investors, um, you know, that would be um, that they that they wanted to enable kind of a, a, a fair playing field in terms of investing investing um, in their company, recognizing that, in fact, it was retail investors and consumers that um, drove uh, growth of their business. So I think we're starting to see companies recognize um, this concept. And Allbirds, great example, um, fought very strongly to um, have their IPO available to Kiwis and, and looked um, very much to actually democratize um, this space um, and kind of get past that level of distrust and engage with investors. All right, so we might just try to start to wrap things up with um, a final question, but no, no easy question, that's for sure. Um, what is next for the retail investor and what can we, what can we expect um, in the space in the next 12 months? Um, Gillian, I might get you to answer this first. We had a question come through from Tony. Um, he said CBA has just announced that they are going to offer customers the ability to buy, sell and hold crypto assets via the bank's app. Um, do the panel see increased risk with FOMO driving some investment decisions? Um, so in terms of this, what can we expect, you know, looking ahead over the next 12 months, do you see um, some increased risk there with this FOMO driving investor behaviour? Uh, well, we specifically asked what they are thinking about in the next 12 months because I guess what we were concerned about was do you get to a certain level where you're feeling quite confident um, and now you want to give something else a go? Um, and, and actually what you can see is that most people aren't really planning on changing the way they invest in the short term at least. Um, uh, and, you know, while you, you can always debate whether they'll actually do what they say they're going to do. What we had also asked was, what have you done since you've joined the platform? And for most people, they did stick with their original investment. And, and um, in the first year, maybe um, they'd add one investment. And then in the second year, they might add a couple of different types of investment as their confidence grows. So, so I think this picture of um, actually sticking to what they're doing, learning, growing, et cetera, is probably pretty accurate based on, on what they told us. Um, we did specifically ask about crypto um, and uh, about a, just under a third of people had some crypto. It was a tiny percentage of their um, portfolio, so less than 3%. Um, and but you know they were saying yes I'm interested in exploring a bit more about um, crypto. Um, some interesting anecdotal quotes throughout the research as well. So one person said I'm a, actually a low risk investor um, and I don't want to you know do anything too crazy, but I'm I want to give crypto a go. So you know <laughs> um, so they really understand the risk there. Um, you know, CBA um, making it available on an app. Look, I think just purely from a behavioural point of view, if something's right in front of you, it does make it much more likely that uh, that you're going to perhaps click that button. Um, you know, we saw this in the in the KiwiSaver space when people were switching. We saw that banks, uh, KiwiSaver customers, were way more likely to switch funds, and it was probably because it was right in front of them on their app and they had a switch button. So, you know, it's, I think it's inevitable if you start putting it in front of people that um, that, that could happen. Uh, I know some of the regulators around the world are starting to look at things like manipulative design on online platforms and, um, uh, you know, whether the, the way that you present uh, certain opportunities leads to people being more likely to take those opportunities. So maybe there's, there's something in there as well. Um, but yeah, I, I guess, yeah, um, generally, I think most of the, the bulk of people are, are going to stick with anything, but there'll be some who want to try some things. And, and just on advice, by the way, 33% um, were saying that in the next few years, they were quite likely to maybe talk to an advisor. So yeah, I don't think traditional advice is dead um, uh, by any means. And, and certainly that um, message about as your, your funds grow, maybe you need some help with the decision making uh, from a professional it does seem to be getting through to some of the users. 
Great, thanks, Gillian. Um, all right, we'll move to you, Hugh. What's your outlook for the next 12 months? And we have a question about robo advice. So maybe if you wanted to just touch on that, um, is there a role for that in retail investing? Yeah, sure. Okay, well, um, yeah, maybe hitting that one first. A absolutely. I mean, uh, I suppose robo advice. Um, I mean, maybe we need to define what that that means first. But um, it, it's a broad um, broad definition, I suppose, in, in using digital tools to to provide regulated financial advice. And we're seeing that. Um, I suppose the first implementations were very technical. Uh, you know, maybe um, developed by actuaries and other people that were thinking more about how to um, solve the problem, how to how to um, develop something that technically uh, was um, perfect, I suppose, but didn't necessarily think um, about the, the the human or the behavioural aspects. Um, and I think where we'll see robo advice going is actually just being incorporated into. Uh, into platforms and into websites and into digital tools in a way that people don't see it as necessarily separate from the overall customer experience. I, I don't think there'll be a, a separate thing called a robo-advisor or, or a robo-advice platform as such. Um, I think the, the other couple of quick things, you know, ETFs will continue to roll out. New Zealand has very low, um, uh, I suppose, uh, distribution of, of ETFs and, you know, SmartShares is still the only ETF uh, uh, issuer on the NZX. We, we fully expect some competition at some point. So uh, I'm being surprised it hasn't arrived already. Um, hurry up, everyone. Uh, and uh, and then, um, but you know, when it when it does arrive, I think we're going to see uh, a bigger bigger move into the space. You know, they are clean, simple, transparent, straightforward investment products. You can you know, so you can see through them. You can see what they hold, uh, and um, and and they're very um, very easy to understand. So. Uh, I would expect we'll see more um, um, growth in that space. Uh, it's absolutely taking off in Australia as well, even amongst uh, financial advisors now um, moving into that space as well. And then I think the last thing, sorry to take time, but um, the last thing is really, um, you know, New Zealand's uh, investment industry uh, has been very domestic. And uh, look, um, this is going to be disrupted. And um, I suppose... You know, we're already seeing moves there. And I know, um, you know, Kristen, with the Hatch transaction with FNZ, one of New Zealand's great cross-border um, financial services success stories um, now involved with Hatch. And, you know, that can only be good spreading. You know, we see sharesies moving into Australia. Um, even the SmartShares ETFs are now being distributed under the trans Tasman Mutual Recognition um, regime into Australia. So uh, we're going to see more um, international uh um, I suppose, cross-border distribution of products as well. Kristen, I know you've got to rush into town for a meeting very shortly. So did you want to just briefly give your um, outlook for the year ahead before you... A uh, year ahead... I yeah, look, the environment is changing. I think um, when a lot of people join these platforms, um, it, it's going to be a little bit of a different world. So it's absolutely on us um, to be educating um, our investors. And in fact, it's our best interest. It's um, not in Hatch's best interest to kind of drive FOMO and drive short term growth for us actually to be a sustainable business and have people um, succeed actually means that they are uh, building meaningful wealth. And so we take that um, really seriously, and we've got to work together as an industry to deliver on that because it is in the best long-term interests um, of of investors. But I do think participation is ha uh, power. So I think um, over the next couple of years and years, certainly hope that, irregardless of what's happening in the economy or the capital um, markets, I do hope that people continue to participate and continue to look um, to those markets to actually uh, as a um, fantastic and very well accepted globally way of of putting our money to work. Um, we'll have to work hard on um, the right behaviours and, and stepping away from FOMO, um, of course, but um, I do think that we'll continue to see participation. Um, we'll probably see some wobbles, um, certainly um, in, you know, with interest rates rising potentially in the property markets, but also um, in no doubt there will be, um, what we do know is, is there will be corrections ahead. So yeah, I look forward to continuing to do good work. I think we're very much in a 1.0, I kind of call those three pillars were in 1.0 and 2.0, um, I just have to trust really smart people people working with user design, so working with our customers and technology to solve the problems that have arisen out of this kind of investor platform 1.0. And I look forward to kind of what 2.0 can, um, can bring. 
Thanks, Christian. And uh, last word to you, Bill. What's your outlook for the next year ahead? Yeah, I just want to confirm and um, reiterate what uh, Christian, you and Gillian all touched on. Um, I um, and us as a team, we viewed 2020 and 2021 as the year where compelling tech became useful tech. And all it really required was a stress test. And the stress test was basically COVID. Um, there was a lot of people who were at home. They had extra discretionary income and they could try it out. And what I see in the, in the year ahead, um, as Kristen said, unfortunately, there's going to be the, the long and slow grind of the normal investment world. I've been at this for about 30 years. Um, it's relentless um, and, and sometimes terrible. And, and, and other times, like the past year, it's euphoric and, and really exciting, and it manages to suck people in. And the challenge really is for these platforms um, to, to coordinate. Um, I definitely do see that that's going to happen. There's a bit of competition, but the, uh, the industry basically needs to um, create um, a compelling um, uh, engagement with the people that have now become users so that they can stay with it for the long term. And that really is, is really the challenge that Kristen basically hit it on the head. Um, I don't think that there's going to be um, a lot of tears. I, I think on average, everything that we've seen, whether it's from the FMA, our research looking in the marketplace, at the SEC, Kristen, you, everyone's doing research. And by and large, people are just behaving really responsibly. Yes, there's going to be someone who's going to do something stupid, but it was going to happen anyway. Um, but by and large, it seems as if you know, people are approaching it with due care and caution. Um, and I think technology is really going to play a, a great role going forward in you know, making investment um, a really rewarding um, endeavour. Thank you so much, Bill. And, and thank you, Kristen, Hugh and Gillian as well um, for that really great discussion. Um, really appreciate you joining us today. I'm now just going to hand over briefly to Tim Bacartness for um, just a vote of thanks from the session sponsor, Brevera Solutions. And then we'll just take a look at some of the exciting um, sessions that are coming up soon. Over to you, Tim. Thanks, Clarissa. And thanks for a really insightful session, panelists. Uh, Gillian, Kristen, Bill and Hugh, that was awesome. Uh, and Clarissa for moderating, thank you. Uh, so my name is Tim Buckinas. I represent Brevera Solutions, and we're really pleased to be involved in the FSC um, and in this session. Um, we're a global fintech developing uh, wealth management advice and fund administration software and deliver that to leading institutions in New Zealand and around the world uh, with over $3 trillion uh, worth of assets uh, entrusted to our solutions. Uh, so our, our purpose as a company is to make our customers successful, which allows them to make their customers successful. And ultimately, if I speak locally, it really enables the financial well-being of New Zealanders. And this session for me resonated with that financial well-being aspect. Um, and it's almost the theme uh, because we heard that this retail um, investment movement, um, it, it's almost democratizing um, the tools and the avenues available uh, and, and providing world-class investment vehicles that are easy to understand. And I really like that quote, um, Kristen, participation is power. Um, we've seen uh, or we've heard from uh, Bill around the impact of the retail investor on larger markets and you know how they took on the professional advisors and, and beat them, uh, but how it wasn't uh, necessarily all rosy behind the scenes. Uh, we've got unregulated and regulated risks, um, and we've we've heard around the um, the impact of uh, conduct on the industry uh, around the the trust aspect. Um, surprisingly for me, because um, this doesn't reflect my personal investment strategy, um, retail investors are largely sensible, um, well diversified ETFs, um, and and little investment on single uh, stocks. So a lot of this, um, a lot of the investors are buying to hold on a well diversified portfolio. Uh, lastly, though, my closing uh, thoughts on this would be that retail investors aren't going anywhere, um, and so the industry has the challenge and the ability um, to support and educate our retail investors. Um, so thanks again very much to our panelists and to the attendees for joining the session. Thanks so much, Tim, and, and thanks again to Rivera Solutions for sponsoring this session. Um, 
Now, you might have seen the announcement come through this week that we've made the quite difficult decision to move um, our conference fully online. So our reimagined series um, has been extended until the 3rd of December. So the session formed part of that um, Regenerations Reimagined series. Um, and then, of course, we've got our two-day Regenerations conference um, on the 6th and 7th of December. And we've got a really stellar program um, over those two days and in the weeks to come. Um, so in terms of what's coming up, here's just a brief look at um, the sessions coming up in the weeks ahead. Um, so we've got one on workplace savings on Thursday this week, um, and you can check out um, the full program um, on the conference website. Um, but thank you so much again um, to all of the panellists, to Brevere Solutions, and to all of our sponsors, um, and to everybody that tuned in for the discussion today. I hope you picked up something valuable, um, and hope you have a great rest of your week.